Fifty years ago, a roaring avalanche of coal waste crashed into a school and 18 houses in the South Wales village of Abervan. Death and destruction were wrought in a few unbelievable minutes. It was a race against time to rescue survivors. I was gasping for breath because the air was getting less and less. Um, but at least I had that pocket of air. Uh, but the panic, I think, set in, really. What, how was I going to get out? I'm sure there's somebody on the air, he was shouting. And when he dug onto my stomach, I could feel the air coming into me. Oh, it's, it's just something out of this world. Like, and I could take a breath, like. 116 children and 28 adults were killed. Not a day goes by that any of us ever forget this terrible disaster. It lives with you and it's as vivid as if it was yesterday. She went through a lot when she was a little baby and to come through all that, and then this happens, why? Why does it happen? But it's no good thinking too much about that. You've got to get on with your life and we've all helped one another, really, over the years. And we always will do. In this film, the people of Abervan tell their stories of tragic loss, miraculous survival and heroic rescue. They also reveal how they have coped with the consequences of the disaster. This is their story of surviving Abervan. Half a century after the Abervan disaster, the site of the school is now a memorial garden, visited by people from all over the world. But it stirs the deepest emotions for the survivors of a day they can never forget. Jeff Edwards, a former mayor of Merthyr Tydfil, is a survivor of that day. Well, this is the site of the Pine Class School and is now the Memorial Gardens, which commemorate the disaster of the 21st of October 1966. The design of the gardens is based on the classrooms within the school itself. This would be Standard 4, this would be Standard 3, this was Standard 2, Standard 3, Standard 2 and Standard 1. Here I think it's quite calm and uh, it's a serene place really for us and uh, effectively it, it, it brings back the memories of the day, but I get a lot of solace in actually coming here. The school faced onto Moy Road with a mountainside behind. In the mid-1960s, this was the heart of the community for the young children of Abervan. Yeah, you. Come get in the car at school. <laughs> Alan Thomas is looking at old family photos with his younger brother, Phil. Both have fond memories of their early childhoods with their friends at Pant Glass Junior School. It's the only card school like we were all the same. Either your dad worked in the colliery or he worked in Hoover's. It was a fabulous, well, I enjoyed school anyway. I never missed, you know what I mean? Always went to school. The teachers, even the teachers were lovable. They were like your special mothers. They were very thoughtful and caring. This is Hetty Williams, a former teacher at Pant Glass School. Her memories of the children before the disaster bring back strong emotions. 21-year-old Hetty was in charge of the first-year juniors. This was where my classroom was, and um, on the anniversary, um, I come back to the school because um, that's where my memories are, and I can still see the children in their classes and things. And I come and there's a tree over there that's twisted and I take a fancy to the tree. <laughs> so I like to go there and put my flowers under that tree. And I feel I can feel my children around me. And you can think back to the days when it was a lovely place. I can see, um, the tables and chairs with the children sitting in them, and they were such a happy group of children. They, they were just adorable. 
Marilyn Brown lost her 10-year-old daughter, Jeanette, in the disaster. She has cherished memories of a little girl ever since. For Marilyn, it is a comfort to keep photographs of Jeanette around her home so that she can touch them as she passes. I don't know, it, it, it gives me a sense of um, she's still with us, you know. There's that feeling of, yes, yes, I, I do remember you and I will always remember you. And another thing as well, I think about and I think she would have been 61 now. And I think, what would she have been like now? What would she have done? Jeanette was a fighter. When she was born, she was rushed to Sully Hospital outside Cardiff with two holes in her gullet. When we eventually went down to Sully to see her, she'd had two operations and they asked me if I would stay there with her, you know. She needed breast milk to keep her alive. I'd be woken up at two in the morning, four in the morning, every two hours, really. And then eventually she came and she was fine. What? Baby. This is Gerald Tarr. He has lived in Aberfan most of his life. As a young married man in the mid-60s, Gerald lived with his wife Shirley in Moy Road near the school and worked at Merthyr Vale Colliery in the village. I was a collier, us digging the coal out. It was really hard work, like. You'd be on your hands and knees sometimes, all day. But when it went low, there was a fault in the ground, you know. Your back was bent, and sometimes the coal was hard, really hard. Oh, it'd be murder than digging it. But uh, I never really liked it on the ground. But at that time, it, it wasn't much you work about, and it was good money in a pit. Coal dominated life in Abervan. The mine was the main employer, and much of the land was owned by the National Coal Board. Mining coal produced a huge quantity of waste that was expensive to transport. So it was dumped up on Mirtha Mountain, above the village, in huge tips. These tips became a forbidden playground for many of Abervan's children. As youngsters, we had quite an eventful and adventurous uh, um, life, really. An enjoyable one with uh, all my friends. We used to play on the tips themselves. And uh, we never told our parents that we used to go up there because we would have had a row had we gone uh, when we got home. So we kept that very quiet. But it was an adventure playground for us, really. Abervan's children also knew about the springs and stream that ran down the mountainside to the River Taff. One man who remembers the stream as a boy is Bernard Thomas. Like other survivors, he returns to the site of his old school every so often. It is not difficult for him to picture the tips that once stood on the mountain above. As a kid, Myself and a good many others used to go up and play on the, the mountain around the tip, towards the tip there. And you also used to dam part of the stream and make a swimming pool not far from the tip. And swimming, the water's freezing cold. Of course, we didn't realise the, the danger. You don't see it when you're a kid. In fact, the covering of this water with coal waste was to prove fatal to the children of Abervan. After decades of dumping on the mountain, the latest tip was built up over the springs and stream. Gradually, the water liquefied the waste into a slurry. Both the junior and senior schools lay directly below the tips. Teachers never imagined their children's lives were at risk. It was a disaster waiting to happen. And on the 21st of October, 1966, it did. Early that Friday morning, Abervan was shrouded in thick autumnal fog. Households with families were stirring for another school day. 
Like his brother Alan, Phil Thomas enjoyed school. He was 10 and in a mixed age class in the junior school. 12 year old Alan was now in the senior school, but both boys always set off for school together. Got up in the morning, mum called us, breakfast. Me, my brother, my sister. We had breakfast that morning, uh, dressed out to the door, down to catch the bus then for school. Couldn't see no further than your nose. It was, it was a horrible day. Jeanette wasn't very good that morning. She was didn't want to go to school. But it was trying it on, really. You know what they are. They don't want to go to school sometimes. Sent her out of the door, set, watched her walking up the street, and shut the door and came in. I said, really good. I'll have a nice cup of tea now. I'll have my breakfast now. In 1966, Karen Thomas lived with her parents near Moy Road. She was aged seven at the time and would walk to school with her cousins who lived nearby. My cousins lived six doors away, so I'd call for them and my mother would stand on the door and we, the three of us left for school that morning with my auntie and my other cousins standing on the door. We walked to the bottom of the street and when we looked back, we couldn't see them because it was very, very misty and foggy. So we just carried on walking, laughing, going to school. The headmistress of Pant Glass School was 64-year-old Anne Jennings. She ran a tight ship and was adored by junior staff like Hetty Williams. At nine o'clock, Miss Jennings rang the bell for the start of the day. I went into the classroom, of course the children were excited because it was half term, we were going to break up. And um, on the last day of term, we didn't have assembly in the morning, we'd have assembly in the afternoon, so Miss Jennings could say, you know, not to go and play on the railway, not to go down by the river, to keep themselves safe. Children in schools up and down the valleys were settling down for their first lessons of the day. I went to get a library book and I walked back to my seat, which was completely the other side of the room. And I was about the third desk up from the front. And uh, we sat down. And then Michael Davis, the teacher, started the first lesson. The paying of dinner money was common to most primary school children. There was a knock on the door for us to go to the dinner lady. So five of us that were nearest the door left the classroom and we went to pay our dinner money. Teacher said that could I go on air and with Robert down to the other school to pick up money he owed for dinners off his sister Margaret. So me and him set off that day. We went down to the other school, we chatted to some of the children that were up on the wall and the gates. It was 9.15. At that moment, high above on tip number seven, a crane operator suddenly saw the coal waste slip away from the edge of the tip. It was the start of a massive avalanche of liquefied slurry, a flow slide that careered down the mountain towards Abervan. Hundreds of feet below, shrouded in fog, the children and adults in Pantglass School and the houses alongside were in mortal danger. Minor Gerald Tarr lived in one of the houses. His wife Shirley had gone to work and he was in bed after finishing another night shift at the colliery. I had a big dog in them days. Buster used to call him. And uh, the dog ran upstairs and right, banged the bedroom door open. Running in the bedroom and his shoes were sticking up in the air. So I went to get up, I said, what's the, what's the matter, boy? What's the matter, what's the matter with you? And uh, with that, uh, the whole ceiling, the whole ceiling split right open all the way, all the way through, about a foot like that. I thought, what the hell's happening here? Yeah? Well, with that then, the back wall come down on top of me and squashed me down into the bed. I could feel it squashing me down. The next thing I realised, I woke up buried alive. 
The avalanche consumed 18 houses on Moy Road, just where Phil Thomas was waiting with his friend, Robert. You couldn't see. You could hear, but you couldn't see what was coming. It was like if somebody was throwing stones at us. So me and Robert ran. Robert went back towards our school, and I ran straight forward. I remember something hitting me on the back of the head, and I was falling. The wall of slurry ploughed into the junior school. You heard this rumbling, thought it was thunder or a jet flying over. And the next teacher shouted, it's running or something, and pandemonium broke out. And I just stayed sitting at my desk and looked up like that, and I could see all, all, out of the mist, out of this fog, all this like a wall of slurry, a tidal wave, tsunami, coming towards the school. I thought, oh, that'll stop outside. And also, it's hit the school, such a force, and noise is unbe the noise is unbelievable. At the other end of the hall, glass started coming down the corridor from the headmistress's room. And Nancy, the dinner lady, jumped on top of us. The wall, I think, more or less pushed us all together, and she took the full impact. 240 children were in Pantglass School when the avalanche struck. It completely destroyed three classrooms on the east side of the building and filled most of the classrooms at the rear with watery black waste. At the front of the school, Hetty Williams was in her classroom with 35 children aged six and seven. I went to the door and there was like an iron girder through the, the glass. And when I looked out, the corridor was like a, well, like a tunnel, things had come down, but it looked as if there was a gap at the bottom. So I said to the children, right now, you go straight out in this fire drill, you stand in the yard, don't go running around. And I went first, and when I got outside, I couldn't believe what I could see, because, um, our end of the room was still standing, that was, that was up, but there was black behind where the classrooms were. You couldn't see anything. It was as if the mountain was right up on the school. It was. One and a half million cubic feet of liquefied slurry had engulfed everything in its path, right into the centre of the village. Phil Thomas was caught up in the avalanche on Moy Road, but miraculously survived. I walk, pitch black, bedded, couldn't see a thing. Started crying, shouting for me, Mum. Karen Thomas and four other children were trapped alive beneath the body of dinner lady Nancy Williams. We were shouting at the dinner lady and I was trying to pull her hair because I could just touch her hair to see if we could have a response for her because she wasn't saying anything to us. I just thought to keep pulling her hair to try and wake her up. We just didn't know what, what was happening because we just couldn't hear anyone else. It was just our voices and our screams that we could hear. I do remember he is of the other kids screaming. Fear and that, screaming for help. Screaming for the teacher, like screaming for the parents. I thought I'd better try and get out of here as quick as possible. Trying to get up, sat up, and looked around, I saw my teacher, and I thought, well, I'll get across to Mr Williams now, and he helped me out through the small panes of glass at the top of the classroom door. We were smashed through. And we got out through there and across the main hall of the school. 110 children and four teachers were able to escape from the parts of the school left standing. These were mostly from the younger classes. But those with seven to 11 year olds took the full brunt of the avalanche. With the fog lifted, 
the first locals on the scene combined together in a frenzied search for survivors. I got up to the school and I just couldn't believe that part of the school had come down. And my first thought was, oh, the children have already come out. But someone said, no, the children are in there. Confusion reigned. The sheer size of the avalanche made it difficult for rescuers to grasp the severity of what they faced. The first call to the emergency services was recorded at 9.25. The Coal Board's Mines Rescue Service was established to rescue miners trapped underground. But with Abervan, the men of this elite squad were given little information about the emergency they had been called to. We were all changed and we were all sat there in the van. And we'd be going to some school up in Merthyr. And I always remember, I turned to the men in the van, I said, gents, this is going to be something terrible. What, what the hell do they want the Mines Rescue Service at a school for? In 1966, Len Haggett was an officer with the Merthyr Tidville Fire Brigade. Within a few minutes of the call from Abervan, fire engines were on their way. It is the first time Len has spoken about his harrowing memories of the disaster. This is the route that I drove the emergency tender down. Uh, the call had been received to a house that collapsed in Moy Road, Abervan, uh, and that's what we were responding to, actually. But there was no way that anyone was aware that the school had been involved. The fire brigade was proud of its service. It was Len's job to rescue people but nothing could prepare him for the catastrophe of Abervan. This is the entrance that I pulled into my room. Immediately we came here, it became obvious that it wasn't a house that was involved. It was a row of houses that simply collapsed. And there was a wall of slurry 20 to 30 foot high, straight off the road going up. The vast amount of slurry divided the rescue effort between one end of Moy Road and the other. At the school, no tools were immediately available, so some women worked with their hands. One of them was Mary Morse. I tried to help as much as I could, and I just got involved in the line of women that were there. We were at the side entrance of the school. Brick for brick was picked up off the floor, and passed along and put to one side. It was like a conveyor belt, exactly like a conveyor belt. But we were just numbed, just numbed, that's all I can say. Many mothers and families stood on Moy Road watching as more and more people joined in the rescue. Amongst them was the Mines Rescue Team. We'd arrived there at 10 to 10 that morning. We pulled up outside the school. Well, it was just chaotic. I don't think anybody realised what we were, they were doing or anything. They were running around like fools, we were, everybody. And why? Come back to the same thing all the time, don't we? Because it's children. Together with the emergency services, Miners from the local colliery started to organise a more coordinated rescue operation. But now the race to find survivors became even more urgent. When the avalanche hit the old railway embankment above the school, it fractured two big water mains that supplied the whole of Cardiff. Hundreds of gallons of water flooded into the already saturated slurry. In the mayhem around the school, 12-year-old Alan Thomas was desperately looking for his brother, Phil. I come out of the school and down this road here, and I got as far as this point where there was a, a river, basically, of slurry and water where, where the, the mains pipe had been burst. And, and the water was being channeled down through the gully here, down to the river. 
As I reached this point, um, I looked up and noticed that my mother was standing on the other side, which I didn't expect. You normally see waves in the sea, but if you can imagine waves coming down through a gully and, and heading down towards the river, it was horrific, it's frightening. It's, it's unnatural, you can't believe it, it was, it was happening, that the, the amount of water and where it was coming from, brown, slurry, thick, and it went down all the way to the river. I'm standing on the pavement shouting, well, I can't find Phil. And she just come through the water without a care. At that moment, Alan's younger brother Phil had been found alive, but trapped in rubble on the other side of the avalanche. He was in grave danger as the torrent of water from the fractured main spread through the slurry. Firemen now battled to free the injured boy before he drowned. He was terrified, understandably, and he was trapped by his feet. And though we could get at his head and shoulders, we, we just could not get him out. And there was probably about six or seven people around this stone trying to lift it, but not succeeding. And then the inrush of water started, and you could hear the people calling the waters coming. And the water was coming, and it was coming in and around this young lad. And we had to hold his head up, back, out of the water that was coming. And we'd done one final lift. And now they lifted that wall that day, I don't know, but we did. We raised it just long enough to get your arms around under his shoulders and as they lifted to pull and he came out and if he hadn't come out within a few minutes he would have drowned. The fact that that young boy was alive and he'd been saved, that was elation without a shot of a doubt. Firemen worked against the clock to pull survivors from the ruins of their houses. Gerald Tarr was pinned down by a bedroom door. He couldn't get my shoulder out of my arm. It was the other side of this door. And this door had crushed me down, like. But uh, as I was digging, this chap came down and I could hear him uh, on top of me. The pipe had busted, he said, if you don't get him out, he said he's going to drown. Oh, I started to claw at the door, I ripped my fingers into this door trying to get me. I thought, I'm not going to drown after all this, like, you know what I mean? I thought, oh my... God, and this fella says, stop clawing you. So I, I take my nails off my fingers, you know, trying to claw this door. So he put a jack in there, he pressed a button and up the door come six, seven inches. And he dragged me out, look. Oh, I thought, thank God for that, I'm not going to drown, you know what I mean? They chucked me on a blanket there and I rushed me to the ambulance, like. The flood of water was having a devastating impact. A million cubic feet of slurry was still moving. It was now starting to engulf the senior school. Back in the wrecked classrooms of the junior school, firemen were inching their way through the mass of muck and rubble. On my left hand side, there was a girl's head and uh, that head was just straight here, uh, next door to my face, really, uh, and I couldn't get away from it, and uh, the, the person had died. All I could see was um, a small aperture of light, and the next thing I remember, the firemen came and they smashed the window and they got in. They got down to the desk itself and they just couldn't shift it because all the stuff was around. And they got the hatches out and they actually broke up the desks. This was the moment Jeff Edwards was brought out. Something hit me on my shoulder 
and I, and I screamed, the other, and then we all started to scream, and then we could see there was a little bit of daylight coming. So we shouted, and we could hear somebody shouting, there's some year. Then he shouted down to tell us, you're OK, we're getting you out. Men and women from the community carried the children to the triage set up in the playground at the school's entrance. After seeing her class to safety, teacher Hetty Williams stayed on to help with the rescue. If they brought a child out, we would bring that child and take it to the doctors then. A lot of the, the, the children that were handed over to us um, were injured, didn't know what had happened to them. They just, they were in shock really. But to see a face, they, they would smile and say, oh, miss, some of them, some of them didn't talk at all. But it was so wonderful to see if somebody's eyes moved, it was absolutely fantastic. Karen Thomas and her four friends were carried to the triage. Like all those rescued, here she was given first aid and her injuries assessed. Karen was diagnosed with internal bleeding. There was a lot of people around me and they were examining me and the next thing I know, I was being bandaged from my neck to my feet, not for me to move. And I was put on a stretcher and put into an ambulance. As news of the disaster spread, more and more people flocked to Abervan to help with the rescue. The most urgent search for survivors was led by firemen and miners working in the ruined classrooms of the school. Volunteers dug at the surrounding slurry and formed bucket brigades to carry the lethal waste away. The flow of water from the broken water mains was finally turned off by 11.30 but the slurry remained in a dangerous state. The spirit of the people there that day was incredible. You went around doing what you think you could for help, where it was needed, and if you ever asked what resources would you want at an incident of that nature, we are the best in the world, we are the miners. They were the boys who could shift the slurry. And they worked a very good system. They would be working, and suddenly you'd hear a whistle blow, and they'd say silence. And how you could obtain silence in those circumstances with that number of people who were present is difficult to imagine, and yet it was. They, you got absolute silence, hoping that you would hear a voice or a call so you could rescue them. But as the hours slipped by into the afternoon, the rescuers were confronted by a grim reality. All the children they were finding in the school now were dead. Many of them were still sitting at their desks, entombed by the slurry. I honestly believe that that slurry was traveling at a rate, obviously, and once it came into that school, it just swept through the school and the damage was done very quickly. You know, if you can understand, the slurry was so small and fine that I like to think that instead the children, more or less, it, it happened and they suffocated straight away rather than suffered and agonies, that sort of thing. I think that's, that's a fair comment too. The liquefied slurry made digging a difficult, slow job, even for experienced miners like Alan Lewis. He was put to work in one of the classrooms. I was there two hours or more before. I first saw a desk clearing mud, every time you clear mud, because it was 30 feet of mud sliding down all the time. There was people up the top, like doing a bucket brigade, taking the top layer off. But as we were advancing in the class, it was sliding down and sliding down. So every time we advanced two foot, It'd be buried, and we advanced two foot six, everything buried. It was advancing quietly like that. Other desks come in front, 
played a bit more, and then we could see the little girls crumped over the desks, two little girls. Well, Doug is one little girl, and she had a ponytail, and at that time my daughter was four year old, and she had a ponytail. So the resemblance was there, and they well, I couldn't help it but filling up. And uh, the overman was behind me. He could see that there was uh, sobbing, tears were rolling on my cheeks, to be honest with you. But uh, he said, do you want to be relieved? And I said, no, 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 I'll carry on. But it was an awful feeling. So, but we carried on and we got that little girl out to the side of a desk, put in a blanket, and we, we, as soon as we got the body out, we shout for a blanket, and someone would come with a blanket and we'd put her in and they'd, they'd take her out on a stretcher. We was there for 10 hours, and in that 10 hours, I dug four little girls out, or helped to dig four little girls out, and uh, the school teacher. It is it's an experience I'll never ever forget. With the lives of so many children at stake, the rescue operation became worldwide news. Earlier in the day, hopes were high of finding many survivors. But the mood changed with each passing hour, as more bodies were brought out. Waiting parents were in agony. We were waiting, thinking, yes, we're going to have news any minute now of, of the children, where they are, and kept asking questions all the time. But you could see, as time was going on, there were more people coming, more people coming to dig. Marilyn's husband, Bernard, had been digging since the morning, hoping to find their daughter, Jeanette. I can remember my husband sitting on the wall, absolutely exhausted. He said, I don't know what to do, Marilyn. He said, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, sit there for a while. But eventually news came through that quite a few of the children had been buried. This time, you didn't want any more news. You didn't want any more news, because they're still thinking, Yes, she'll be all right, she'll be fine. The dead were taken to a makeshift mortuary set up in Bethania Chapel in the village. For many waiting parents, the moment they dreaded came when they were asked to go to the chapel to identify their child. Marilyn's husband and her father returned from the temporary mortuary to tell her their news. My father started to cry and I said, is she all right? And he said, no, Jeanette had died, he said. Just identified her. Oh, I said, I want to go, I want to go and see her. No, no, he said, you don't go and see her, she's fine, he said. I said, what does she look like? He said, She's got a tiny mark on her head. And he said, she's sleeping. And that was that. Well, I just give in to it then. My father, he was crying. And I think it was because he was crying, I was crying as well. But it sort of comes over you then. Yeah, she's gone. end of the day, 60 bodies had been recovered from the disaster area. Eventually, the death toll reached 144, 116 children and 28 adults. One of the adults to lose his life was 21-year-old teacher Michael Davis. His friend Hetty Williams was asked to identify him. Michael didn't have a mark on him. His suit was fine, but he was he had died straight away. I think it was on the second day that they found Miss Jennings. Miss Jennings was one of the last. I realised it's never going to be the same again, you know? And, and thinking of, of people like Michael and Marge, 
only just started teaching and, and their lives had gone. Madge had, had got married in the summer and, and had a, you know, a future in front of her of, and having children and things like that, you know? And it was all wiped up because of this slurry. Nine months later, a tribunal found the National Coal Board was to blame for the disaster. But there were no prosecutions. The tips were removed only after a bitter campaign by the community of Abervan. The memorial garden laid out over the site of Pantglass School is lovingly maintained. It is a fitting reminder for those who perished there now 50 years ago. But since then, survivors of the disaster have faced a struggle to overcome injury and trauma. When Phil Thomas was rescued, one ear was hanging almost off. He had two head wounds and a badly injured hand. The doctors managed to save his ear, but not his three crushed fingers. After the operation, Phil first saw his hand when nurses came to change his bandages. He said, we're going to change your dressing on your hand now. I just cried. I just cried. That broke my heart. But I knew, so... But then you just get, you just get on and get on with it, like. Alan Thomas was finally reunited with his brother Phil when he visited him in hospital. It was the first time they had seen one another since early on the morning of the disaster. When, upon meeting him, the first words he said to me was, look at my boxing glove. And I said, that's all right. That's not a problem. And uh, that was it. We were, we were reunited. And we're still the same today. Uh, so is that dummy? I <laughs> always <laughs> said it was a gutsy <laughs> bag. <laughs> when the nurses took me in and he said, you have lost your fingers. I think that was the shock. Now, I don't miss them. I'd rather be without them than with them. And, 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 and that's the truth, that is. You know, I wouldn't know what to do if I had bloody ten fingers. <laughs> I wouldn't. I, I would not know what to do. On again. Right. During the avalanche, Gerald Tarr suffered a broken pelvis, a crushed shoulder, and lacerations across his head. His wife Shirley cried when she first saw him in hospital. I said, stop crying, don't cry, I'm, I'm OK. I said, I'll be OK, you know. I'm only happy to be alive, I said. I'm happy, I said, just to be living. I said, look at all them people who are me dead, like, you know what I mean? All my neighbours are gone, everything I said. All them kids. It took years for his injuries to heal. Then Gerald and Shirley had a child of their own. But his feelings for the children lost in the disaster remain as strong as ever. I can remember like it was yesterday. Still in my mind now. I don't know if I could have saved one of them kids. I'd go through it a dozen times. But you just save one. That's the truth. Yes, 40. In 1967, a temporary school and play centre was set up in Abervan in a village club. Here, the children of Pantglass School who survived the disaster were supervised by the four teachers who also survived. When they started to come back, the, the ones that survived, they were so frightened to begin with, but seeing us and knowing that we'd been there as well, they knew they could talk to somebody. We knew what they had gone through 
and what we had gone through. And we just needed to see one another and to see the children smile at you and say, oh, miss, what do you think of that, you know? The new junior school for Abervan was opened three years later, next to the colliery. Our aim was to make that school as good as it had been and to remember the people who had worked there. And for us, it was to continue that with the children and to make sure that those children were happy, that they, they, they were in the same school, in a different place, but it was still Pagla School. Today, an SON community primary school stands near the site of the colliery that closed in 1989. Jeff Edwards is visiting the school to talk to some of the children about the disaster that happened 50 years ago. He feels it's important to make a link between their generation in the village and his own. So really, you're talking to somebody who was a, a bit of history, really, uh, me sitting here, uh, because at the time of the disaster, I was eight years of age, and I was very lucky because out of my class of 34, uh, only four of us survived, me being one of them. So I'm able to tell on behalf of all those people who lost their lives on that day uh, what happened, and so that people never forget what happened in the village. See? How were you involved? How was I involved? Well, in the morning of the disaster, I lived on Abervan Road. Um, down by... Most of my friends perished in that disaster. So my childhood ended on that day, really. And I had to become a different person after. And you, you definitely are a different person from the person that you uh, were. We were very emotional. We could get upset very, very easily. We would still think about our friends who had gone. And it was really, life was difficult really in the village in terms of growing up without friends. The majority of children who died in the disaster were laid to rest in a special part of the cemetery in Abervan. Among the survivors, the 29 children buried alive suffered deep psychological scars. In the years that followed, they relived their traumatic experiences in nightmares. And for some, they continue to this day. Jeff Edwards was trapped with his face against the head of a dead girl for nearly two hours. The most distressing thing was this girl's head on my shoulder and the inability really to, to get away from that. And subsequently, you know, I used to have terrible nightmares for many, many years after having sight of that girl in my memory all the time. It was so upsetting. And I still have those nightmares on occasions. I still suffer from deep bouts of depression. And I found that talking about these things um, helped tremendously uh, because it releases from your subconscious those things that were, many people have hidden away. And these were huge things that our parents had to deal with, really, and all the parents of those children had to deal with because we all suffered the same symptoms in many respects. Karen Thomas suffered internal bleeding and lost a kidney during the disaster. She likes to visit the cemetery to pay her respect at the grave of Nancy Williams, the school dinner lady who died, shielding Karen and four classmates as rubble came crashing over them. It's only down to Nancy that I am here today. And the only way that I can thank her is to go and put flowers on her grave. And I go up every year, no one knows that I, I do it, but I, I do go up there and I do put flowers up there every year. 
And that's just the only way that I can thank her. I'll never be able to thank her enough for saving us. She took the full impact. She gave her life to save the five of us. I was one of the lucky ones to come out and I do feel very lucky to be here today. It's something you'll never forget, but you know, you've got to keep, your life got to go on. Women are gathering for another meeting of Aberfan wives. It is a group that originated in the early years after the disaster. Aberfan then was engulfed in sorrow, a whole community living with grief. There were streets with five or more bereaved families. Many fathers and mothers found it difficult to cope. Marilyn Brown was grieving for her daughter. You would meet them in the street. You would just say, hello, you all right? And but just say, are you OK? I'm OK, yes, I'm fine. Yeah, and that was that, you know. But you wouldn't talk about the child they'd lost or anything like that. You wouldn't say nothing about it. You were afraid of upsetting other people, I suppose. You knew how you felt and you kept it in, so you, you wouldn't say too much to them. But they were going through the same thing as you were going through, really. If you know anybody, we were thinking of the... Weekly meetings of bereaved mothers started up in the village, and from this, a young wives group was later formed, with the idea of organising talks and social outings. Oh, no, no, no. Very, very interesting. It was a way for the women of the village to come together. That made us feel a lot better because we were all together doing things, you know, and helping one another that way. We must have been about 60 women, and it was wonderful. We had trips to go, you know, different things on, jumble sales to make money. Uh, we had go, went out and entertained the old people in the old people's homes. We dressed up and did loads and loads of things. But we enjoyed ourselves, and I think the camaraderie was there then. Mary Morse was a founding member of Young Wives. It was a marvellous group, and it brought a lot of people out, including myself. And there were a lot of people there that had lost children in the disaster, and some had lost their homes also in the disaster. And we felt that in the wives, we could talk about it. We could cry about it and we could laugh and no offence was taken. But not a day goes by that any of us ever forget this terrible disaster. It lives with you and it's as vivid as if it was yesterday. Nearly 50 years on, the group is still going strong. Like all bereaved parents, Marilyn Brown cherishes the memory of her lost child. Jeanette had overcome two life-saving operations before she was killed in the disaster. The memories of her, I keep very safe. I, I keep them here. She went through a lot when she was a little baby, and to come through all that, then this happens. Why? Why does it happen? But it's no good thinking too much about that. You've got to get on with your life, which I have. I'm very happy now. And I have a lot of joy out of my children. And I have a lot of joy out of my friends as well, who've helped me all. With, well, we've all helped one another, really, over the years. And we always will do, always will do. For the first time since the disaster, 
Phil Thomas is meeting two of his rescuers from the fire brigade, Dave Thomas and Len Haggett. Everybody helped and done everything that they could have. And I don't know what more could have been done in that disaster. It wasn't the one which you were given a lot of time to prepare for or even to be able to effect rescues. It happened so quickly. Mainly hidden, well, to be honest. Yeah. There was only a, a fair bit of your head and shoulders yeah. sticking out. Yeah. And Until this in. day in this meeting, I never knew who dug me out. Well, there was, there was about six or seven people. Yeah. There were seven. I would there. like to thank both of you. You're more than welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're only sorry we couldn't get more up. But I'm glad to see you You're looking at yeah. the wall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're looking good now. Anyway. Yes, yes. The Ernest Owen Choir came out of the companionship formed in the village after the disaster. The activities initiated by the community have given comfort to survivors and bereaved families. The community centre in Abervan was built on the part of Moy Road destroyed by the avalanche. As mayor of Merthyr Tydfil, Jeff Edwards strove to improve the quality of life in Abervan, but he was always reminded of those denied that opportunity. I, I'm proud with what we've done in the community. Um, I hope that those contributions have made a difference to people's lives, which I think they have. I think they still have a contribution to make, uh, but I always remember those people who lost their lives at such an early age and weren't able to fulfill their uh, role in society and contribute to making a difference to the community as a whole. And I think that is the tragic loss of Aberfan, really a generation that was wiped out. No Abervan remains the worst disaster involving children in modern British history. It should be remembered, not only for the generation that was lost, but also for the courage and determination of the survivors. Yeah.